Hi. Um, could I ask you all to do something? Could you, I'm gonna get the mic here. Could you all close your eyes? I just want you to imagine um, Dean Street, Gowanus, Brooklyn, about 40 years ago. La, 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 la. They're two girls. They're sitting on a stoop. They're singing along with the radio. Oh, baby, you're the one I'll remember, but you're playing me for a fool. Another girl skates by. She's singing her own song. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. Doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, big man, little man, what are you gonna be? Will you ever sing your song to me? Down the corner, there's a nerdy little boy. He's singing his lament. You buy comics, put them in plastic. Spider-Man, Thor, and the Fantastic Four. But when things start getting drastic, Torch and Thing are not doing anything for you. On the corner, there's a church. You can hear Reverend Gibbs singing there. It rained, my children, it rained. And Noah started to pray. On the other corner, there's a bodega, and the guy's listening to the radio to a whole other song. Grab something, grab something, hold on tight. You gotta grab something, grab something, and never let go. And in his house, a formerly great soul singer is listening to a record of his signature song. I'm just walking down the street. And the street is lonely. There's no one to save me, and no one for me to save. Now imagine all those songs happening at once. That's the harmony and the sound of Dean Street, at least Dean Street in my mind. Um, today, you can open your eyes. I just want to talk to you about writing a song um, and the process of it, and uh, let's say the checklist of some formal strategies. I don't want to say rules because I tend to throw things against the wall and see if anything sticks. It's sort of like there's an angel on one shoulder and there's a devil on the other shoulder, like in those cartoons with like Sylvester the cat. And the angel is saying, you really need to follow the rules of writing this song. And the devil is saying, rules schmools. And then they have a big fight. And at the end, you sometimes end up with a song if you're lucky. Um, so the song I'm going to talk to you about is a pop song from a musical based on a novel. Uh, the novel, these are all my horrifying notes, is A Fortress of Solitude by Jonathan Lethem. Um, the novel is an extraordinary uh, vision of America in the last quarter of the 20th century told through the lens of pop music. It's the story of two boys, uh, best friends and neighbors, one white, one black, growing up together on Dean Street in Brooklyn, in Gowanus. Uh, it's also the story of a beautiful dream that cannot survive. Um, one of the boys, Mingus, his father is that soul singer that I was ta telling you about. The other boy, Dylan, his mother gives him a dream that in a song and in Brooklyn, uh, there might be this middle space, this uh, place where all the conflict and all the extremes and all the things that plague American culture might be resolved, might be solved. And he lives with that dream. Um, until he realizes at the end that his mother's dream was an illusion. His friendship with Mingus dissolves. Uh, he, uh, Dean Street has been gentrified. <laughs> and in the end, he realizes that, like all of us, he's been seduced and fooled by pop music. So the reason I fell in love with this novel when the director, Daniel Auken, gave it to me was the way that Jonathan fuses together his narrative with a, almost a history of the last 25 years, sort of a fictional fake, but just as real as the real reality, history of pop music. Um, and he weaves in soul, pop, gospel, funk, punk, hip hop, rap, even the invention of scratching finds a place in his narrative. And I started dreaming of what if you could create a fictional jukebox musical full of songs that had never existed. Could you write those songs? And what would happen if you did? So let's talk about pop songs and theater songs, because they aren't exactly the same thing. Um, I've always loved the idea of maybe there could be a musical in which the way pop music actually exists in our lives was represented, the way that pop songs are almost omnipresent, the way they pop up when you least expect them, the way that the emotions and memories they bring up have everything to do with where you were and what you were doing when you heard them, and not necessarily with 
what the song itself is about. For me, uh, I don't know, the song One by U2, which is a very emotional ballad, makes me very nervous because the first time I heard it, I was on my way to take the SATs. The song 99 Problems but, uh, uh, <laughs> by Jay-Z, to me, is about the loss of young love. Uh, you can ask me why later. And uh, every song on the album Yankee Hotel Foxtrot by Wilco is about 9-11 even though that album was recorded before any of the events of September 11th, 2001, to me. Um, think of a pop song. Think of the emotions or the memories that that song brings up. Do they necessarily have anything to do with the content of the song? That's something that I've always wanted to capture. So, in this show, I'm trying to use pop songs to parallel the emotional lives of the characters and not necessarily to further the plot. I, I tried to create a score in which the songs really feel like songs that you already know, and the characters live their lives, and the songs play, and sometimes the characters even get to sing along with those songs. And by putting a lot of pop textures together, I've also tried to explore the ways in which American music really is just the fusion of different styles, is putting one song on top of another song and seeing what happens, just like that block in Brooklyn where everyone is singing his or her own song, but together those songs make something strange and new and sometimes kind of wondrous. And of course, at the end of all this, Dylan, uh, who has lived his life inside of a song, has to figure out what all these songs mean. So when you're writing a song, the first question people ask is, and Honestly, I started backwards. I had a title before I had anything else. Um, I, <laughs> I found the title in the last pages of Jonathan's novel, uh, and I just want to read a couple things from that. We all pined for those middle spaces, those summer hours when Josephine Baker lay waste to Paris, when Bothered Blue peaked on the charts, when a teenage Elvis, still dreaming of his own first session, sat in the Sun Studios watching the prison airs, when Juice just flowed, a middle space opened and closed like a glance. You'd miss it if you blinked. We were in a middle space then, father and son moving forward. That's uh, Dylan and his dad listening to a Brian Eno song. So I had a great title from that. Um, the problem was I also had a Brian Eno song, which is an amazing song. So I had to forget the Brian Eno song and <laughs> move forward with my own song, which is hard. So you have a title. What happens next? This is exactly what you're not supposed to do when you're writing a theater song. You're supposed to find it in the character, find it in the story. Instead, I just had this uh, insistent hook at the back of my brain, which just went like this. La, 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 la. And the song makes a space. So what do you do with that? I had the song makes a space, which isn't nothing. Um, you can see. Then I started scribbling some stuff. I found that that just started repeating in my brain, so I made a chorus out of it, repeating, and the song makes a space over and over again. In fact, the first time I gave it, my first horrible error I made, it's the first time I repeated it so many times that the actor who was singing it was like, we get it, the song makes a space, please stop. <laughs> Which was a sadness. Um, so I had no song, I had a title, I had a hook, I kind of had a chorus, so every great song has a, a conceit. I like to call it the metaphor of the song. For instance, in uh, Guys and Dolls, Adelaide's Lament, which is really, let's say, face it, the most perfect theater song ever written. Um, Adelaide's Lament, her cold is a metaphor for her failed relationship. In the Tony Braxton song, You're Making Me High, drug use is a metaphor for sex, um, I think. Uh, <laughs> those are just two songs. Um, but I realized for this song, which was at the end of a show about pop music, the metaphor was the song itself. The song is the metaphor for the way that Dylan and all of us can misunderstand our lives. And um, through that, you realize that the music is the problem and possibly the song is wrong. And what does it mean if the song has been wrong all along? And slowly, uh, I began to realize the song was gonna have to be a criticism of songs themselves, which begs the question, if you're writing a song that wants to be a an emotional catharsis but also is telling you that songs are wrong, what the heck is that going to be? It's a little like Madame Bovary, which is a novel in which in exquisite prose it tells you that if you read novels, you will end up taking poison. <laughs> so, again, a problem. Where do we go from here? Okay, so the angel on your shoulder tells you to find a form. 
So a song structure gives you landmarks. You know when you've reached the chorus, you recognize the bridge, the ending feels like an ending. So I began to try to find some kind of basic structure for uh, the song, and something emerged. Um, and through that, I also though realized that the song, if it was gonna be a critique of songs, had to be able to break down, had to fall apart. And so at certain points, um, verses go on too long, and at one point in the bridge, the lyrics actually go, the bridge is kind of awkward, and the bridge leads to nowhere. And at that point, the bridge actually does sort of start meandering and going nowhere. So the song became, I hoped, a criticism of songwriting itself. So you also can use rhymes and scansion. Scansion is the way that words fit the music to clarify the song. Um, rhymes help deliver humor and uh, they show you when a line is coming to the end. They help you understand what kind of song you're, you're doing. And I stole the rhyme structure of this song uh, from a pop, one of my favorite pop songs. I won't tell you which one because I stole it. And um, what I like about this form though, if you just listen to the first uh, verse, Someday all these bullshit songs will be of use. Someday all these old refrains will set you loose. Someday you will find the meaning of the time you were seduced. So if you see, what's cool is it starts with an idea, and then there's almost a counter idea, which are the B rhymes, but then it flips back on itself. It kind of snaps shut at the end, a little bit like a limerick does. So I love this form. And yeah, honestly, theater songs tend to prefer clever, perfect rhymes and perfect scansion, while you can like think of uh, Cole Porter, good authors who once knew better words now only use four-letter words, writing prose, anything goes. Amazing. Uh, whereas uh, pop songs tend to use assonance and imperfect scansion. Uh, if you think of the Beach Boys, um, you know it's gonna make it that much better when we can say goodnight and stay together, which is not perfect, but I mean, that's probably as good a pop song as has ever been written, so I'm not gonna criticize Brian Wilson. Uh, I love that song, maybe even more than I love the song Anything Goes. Um, and I don't think that these two tendencies of pop music and theater music have to be mutually exclusive. People don't express themselves perfectly. They fit too many syllables in a beat, as I tend to do. Uh, they s suddenly rhyme when they didn't mean to, or they don't rhyme when they want to. And sometimes apparent incompetence can be a form of expression. Sometimes it's incompetence, that's true. But I hope in the song you hear Dylan struggling to articulate his problems in the lyrics, and there's an awkwardness to the way he does that. And sometimes things are awkward on purpose. I think we forget that. So you find a voice, and you, sometimes people repeat their words. In this song, I realized that it was Dylan's dream, and I wanted to start with something that would express that. So every verse starts with the word someday. He keeps repeating someday, 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 until by the end of the song, someday is now. We're at that moment you were hoping for, and in fact, it's arrived with a vengeance, and everything you were hoping for has come to nothing. And so the song belongs to Dylan, but after the first chorus, he realizes the song really belongs to the ensemble, belongs to everyone else who was singing all those songs when he was first on Dean Street. And that's when the structure of the song really comes to a complete, for lack of a technical term, the song has a nervous breakdown. Uh, and <laughs> there really is no technical term for a nervous breakdown in a song. Um, and the harmonies become more dissonant and there's a crisis in the song. And after the crisis, Dylan tries to get his act back together, tries to make sense of everything around him. But at the end comes the final lyric of the play, which was the first lyric of the play what those two girls were singing on the block when we first saw them is all that Dylan is left with. He has no words left, just these pop syllables. La, 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 la. And, um, oh yeah, uh, I made a lot of terrible, you make a lot of mistakes writing a song, and I mean, I'll just show you, those are my notes to myself. <laughs> I just like where I wrote bad at the bottom left and under, I don't even know what was bad, but something was very bad. Um, but the biggest mistake I made was I got so seduced, like Dylan does, by the pop song that I forgot that it was a theater song. I forgot, why is this person singing? What are they doing? And in fact, the actor who was trying first to sing the song said, I don't know why I'm starting to sing. And um, I didn't know either. So we basically, um, <laughs> my co-writer, Edomar Moses, said, well, why don't we have his mother, who gave him this dream that's turned out to be wrong, come in and just remind him what that dream was? And so we had her start to sing this dream, which in a weird way that surprised me echoes the song that Dylan's about to sing. And then we had, one by one, the rest of the ensemble 
come in and just start singing all those fragments of pop songs, those songs I sang to you at the beginning when you closed your eyes, and they piled on top of each other, except now instead of making a beautiful, beautiful harmony, they make something sort of awful, something terrifying. Somebody needs to do something to stop all these songs. It's Dylan who needs to do something, and he needs to sing. If you make a little space, keep your finger on the trigger. If you listen to the song, then the space will soon get bigger and the song will fill that space and the space will grow I know it will, I know it will This is our mission This is a gift This is our mission Bullshit songs will be of use Someday all these old refrains will set you loose Someday you might find The meaning of the time you were seduced You were seduced Someday you'll find the random shuffle makes no sense the order you imposed was just a pretense The chorus that meant so much That chorus is a crutch And the feelings it holds up are too intense And the bridge is kind of awkward And the bridge leads to nowhere And the refrain in circles and circles and circles on and 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 the song makes a space and the song makes a space and the song makes a space on some patch of green on some patch of green and on that green to hold on, to hold on, to hold on before it slips away. But what if the song was wrong all along? And what if the song was wrong? And what if your mother was wrong? And your father was wrong? You didn't belong, you didn't belong. Oh. was a made-up place and you can never get some closure from Holland and Dozier Sam Cooke and Michael Jackson can't give no satisfaction all the songs that you had sung so foolish and so young cannot make up for what's gone without a trace someday all these songs won't make us feel so We'll publish fancy books to great acclaim And without warning it's upon us We come back to go on us And it has a brand new name And the song is still the same But the song makes a space But the song makes a space 